Okay, we've got some key matchups coming up in week 10 of collegiate football. And um, things are starting to get a little bit interesting in the NFL. All that coming up. Let's talk football! All right, welcome to Let's Talk Football, episode 12. I'm your host, John Barons. And I'm Joshua Perkins. So we, um, NFL, we've come up on the trade deadline and we've had a, a almost like a rash of, uh, you know, your typical trade deadline trades. Um, Broncos shipping Demarius Thomas to um, Houston. Now Houston has just became more dangerous. Well, I mean, they did just put the uh, they did just put Fuller on the uh, injured reserves. So, but I mean, Demarius Thomas. I mean, that's a I mean, that's a pretty good replacement for Will Fuller. And now that you still got Deion, you guess you still got DeAndre Hopkins at yeah. wide receiver, mm-hmm. and Deshaun Watson, who's really coming to his own for this Texans offense this season. Texans are riding a five game win streak right now. Yeah, and then uh, Green Bay shipping Haha Clinton Dix to Washington. And they also ship Ty Montgomery to Baltimore. <laughs> so here's a lesson, kids. If you don't want to get shipped off to another team, how about when you receive a kickoff to be the last team to receive the ball, don't take it out. If you're going to go ahead and give it to the be- one of the best QBs in the league, take a knee and let your quarterback do the magic. Mm-hmm. So Ty Montgomery, I hope you, I hope you learned a lesson. Next time, take a knee. Well, you're going to the Ravens, so you might want to re- take it out, you know, Take out the end zone. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> what are you saying that Joe Flacco's not uh, on the same par with Aaron Rodgers? Uh, no. I mean, Joe Flacco, I mean, I wouldn't consider Joe Flacco as elite as Aaron Rodgers. Now, Joe Flacco, he, he is a formidable is quarterback. Formidable quarterback, but I wouldn't put him on the same level as Aaron Rodgers. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, his skill set is uncanny. Yeah, we we'll continue. Um, Lion shipping Golden Tate to the Eagles. I, I actually saw that one. I mean, you just gave Carson Wentz another weapon. Mm-hmm. Although the Eagles have uh, definitely been struggling as of late. They uh, have. I mean, they were able to get back in the win column in London against a struggling <coughs> Jacksonville team who has just gone flat. <laughs> they came in the season with a lot of momentum, and they were a team that a lot of people were looking at to come out of the AFC. And it's just... They're not producing up to standard this year. They are way below standard, and they're way behind schedule. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm very much surprised that Jacksonville has had the problems that they have had. There's um, definitely some games they should have won that they just flat didn't. Well, I just want to say, like, you know, a reason is Leonard Fournette is hurt. He's Leonard Fournette. Is it seems that ever since he got into the league, he cannot stay healthy. And he was a major part of that Jacksonville offense last season, which is why Blake Bortles was so successful. And not having Leonard Fournette out there, I feel that that Jacksonville has lost a a huge step in their offense. And Blake Bortles is not as comfortable as he was. He's not as poised and composed as he was last season. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, the Jacksonville Jaguars just seem like a huge disappointment from uh, all perspectives, defense included. Uh, and uh, since we're on the topic of Jags, uh, they did just trade um, Dante Flower to the Rams. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You just gave the Rams defense another weapon. I know, but but Flower has kind of underperformed in Jacksonville. I mean, especially for considering he was a first-round pick, he definitely hasn't played like one. Well, I feel that him going to L.A., going to a coach like Sean McVay, and, you know, with Sean McVay, he, he's a head coach who wins heart, hearts and minds. He's young. He, you know, he, he's very energetic. And he's a guy that the players that, from what I've seen, the players are able to relate to. And it's just, he got the whole Ram team on, on, on the same page. You know, they're 8-0 right now. They're picking up from where they left off last season. And they are one of the most unstoppable teams in the league right now. 
It's just they bought into what he brings to the table. And I feel they're bringing Dante Fowler on. I feel he can, he might be able to turn over a new leaf with Sean McVay as his head coach. Okay, so um, Hugh Jackson and Todd Haley get fired by the Cleveland Browns. Uh, and now their in- interim coach is Greg yeah. Bounty Gate Williams. The ringleader of the bounty gate. So, uh, which player is going to have bounties on their heads now? Look, I'm just going to ba- say. Baker Mayfield? He's not going to try and get his own player hurt. They need Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I know. But He's not yeah. going to try and get his own player hurt. Come on now. You don't know that. <laughs> I mean, Greg Williams, when he was defensive coordinator with the Saints, he never tried getting his own players hurt. Now, I know they did put That's because Sean Payton would uh, like uh, eat his head if he did. Well, now nobody's going to eat his head because the front office just don't care. I mean, they fired Hugh Jackson and Ty Haley. I mean, something they should have done quite some time ago. Well, you know, I understand the firing of Hugh Jackson, but uh, Todd Haley, I mean, you're not even a whole year under his uh, guidance on the offense. And there was just uh, no chemistry chemistry there in the in the in the uh, coaching staff and Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Jackson and uh, Haley just butted heads all the time and, and, and I actually agree with you on that point because I feel that with Ty Haley I mean I feel that he's a, a better offensive coordinator than what he's portrayed to be and I feel that with Hugh Jackson as head coach having that dominion over the team I felt <clears> that it restricted Ty Haley's on Ty Haley on his play calling I feel that it was kind of like a like Hugh Jackson was kind of like dead weight to Todd Haley in a sense because of Todd Haley I mean I feel that I mean you saw the Browns versus Saints the Browns they they ran they were very conservative mm-hmm. and I feel that Todd Haley's a lot more aggressive than what he's portrayed to be as an offensive coordinator well one of the things that I, I uh, read into was that um, it seems like uh, they didn't like how well, one of the things they, they they didn't want to like uh, overwhelm Baker Mayfield. I mean, uh, that uh, H- Haley's and and Hughes uh, conflict and and disagreement on how to run the offense because Jackson wanted to run it up tempo and Haley wanted to you know uh, huddle up, take a you know three or seven step back. And, and uh, look around and pass, but uh, I don't know. There's just too much conflict there. It seems like. Well, I mean, it's two sides of the spectrum. I mean, when you're a rookie quarterback like Baker Mayfield, on you know, one side of the coin, I mean, you want to slowly try and bring him in and slowly let him adapt. You know, you want to you know you want to let the the veterans you know kind of teach him on the fly. You want the veterans to kind of like you know be able to guide him out there on the field on and off. But on the other side of the coin, you're a professional quarterback. You should be able to adapt to anything and everything on that field, to the, the faster tempo, to expanded playbooks, to going against faster defenses. I mean, you got to be able to I mean, that That's what you're paid to do. You're paid millions to do it. And so, I mean, it's a 50-50. It can go either way, whether, you know, you don't want to overwhelm Baker Mayfield, but then again, he's the leader of your offense. He's the face of your franchise, and you have a future – laid out for him pending if everything goes his way all right so one of the things is okay so kansas city won again they beat denver uh 30 23 so now that makes them seven to one of course a lot of the people are like nice a lot of people a lot of experts and analysts out there i mean they, they get behind the teams that are doing well which of course natural thing to do the problem i have with kansas city is my uh, yeah i love patrick mahomes don't get me wrong patrick mahomes is the next big thing in the nfl oh most definitely uh and they got some pretty sick uh, uh players on offense with kareem hunt and Ty- tyreek kill and uh what's the tight end's name kelly travis kelsey travis kelsey yeah um this chiefs team reminds me of a lot of, of um the early 2000 Colts. Just oh my a, God! Just absolutely balling Un- on offense, 
unrelenting offense. But not a single lick on defense. I mean, it's just, well, with the Colts, you know, we're un- under Tony Dungy, having Peyton Manning, Dallas Clark, Marvin Harrison, Reggie Wayne, Edgerin James, also having Jeff Saturday as your center. I mean, having an offense like that who was consistent in almost every single drive, every single game, I mean, one thing about the Colts, I mean, yeah, not a single lick on defense, but at the same time, they were content with that. They were con- I, they were content with having a, a super offense in a, a mediocre defense because I mean they didn't really care just as long as they won games and that's how the Chiefs are now. Well, you see, that's the thing. Uh, you know, the Colts back in the early two thousands and I don't know, like, like through the almost an entire decade until until Peyton Manning. I mean, they have more of more of a defense and like. 0809 that, that right around then when they were making their run at two Super Bowl appearances in four years but I mean they would just out shoot everybody and then that would get them you know what 12 13 14 years most years in a, in a uh, number one seed in a playoff and then they lose because when they ran into teams that did have a defense and also had the offense to complement it they, they, they couldn't do anything. So what's to keep the Chiefs from, from you know, going, uh, what, 14 or 15 and 1 and then losing their first opening game at home? And most likely they, they might have to meet Tom Brady in the playoffs. Uh, no, most likely about it. it. That's a guarantee at this point. And, you know, the Patriots, I mean, and you're looking at a Patriots team. Yeah, they started the season off rough, but they found their footing. I mean, Tom kind Brady, of what they always do. I mean, Tom Brady, forty-one, and still playing at, at the top of his game. You know, no, that is just that their offense has found their team has found their stride offensively and defensively. And so, I mean, I wouldn't say that Patriots defense is best in the league, but I mean, they have a, they have a defense that that can lay a few licks on you, and they have an offense that can complement it. And if the Chiefs don't get their defense together, because the defense was just abysmal against New England. Well, the Chiefs' defense has just been abysmal pretty much all season long. And I feel that, yeah, the Chiefs, I mean, when it comes to the draft and when it comes to offseason, this is when the Chiefs got to get players on their defense. Oh, yeah. Uh, it just um, would now would be the time to go out and get some while you your players like Patrick Mahomes are still on their rookie contract. You're able to say, Miami, you don't want to wait until Patrick Mahomes at the end of his rookie contract. You got to give him an extension because Zarek has space can run out very quick. Yep. Especially when you have a top tier quarterback. And then you have Travis Kelsey. And then not only that, you also have Tyreek Hill. And you also have Kareem Hunt. Yeah. Okay. So the Chiefs window is now. Yeah. Well, I, I know. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I mean, they're gonna have their their young players for a while, you know. But as far as like maybe building a defense to to at least be decent on the other side, yeah, I can see that uh, that that financial window is now. But the Chiefs are definitely with Mahomes at quarterback is are are pretty much the future. I mean, they're, they're, they're bound to be one of the most dominant teams in the league. I wouldn't put them as, you know, the elite team in the league right now because, I mean, they got to build up a defense. But they're definitely on their way, and they're definitely on the right track. Yeah, you know, another team that's doing really, really uh, well right now that I, I'm not sure how they're still undefeated is the Rams. I mean, it's like every week they, f- they find a way um, not to lose. I won't say find a way to win. It's more of find a way not to lose. Mm, exactly. Like but the I mean, Packers game. It, it came down. The dude, McGovery, fumbled the ball, and Aaron Rodgers never got the chance to even go get a game-winning field goal. And Ty Montgomery, being Aaron Rodgers' teammate, well, now former teammate, you should know in your years of playing with Aaron Rodgers that if the Packers get the ball last <laughs> in the game and the game is on the line, Aaron Rodgers is going to deliver. Whether it's a long game-winning drive, as you saw against San Francisco on Monday Night Football this season, or the Hail Mary throw, which, I mean, I wouldn't 
advocate the Hail Mary, you know, as a way to, you know, but still Aaron Rodgers being one of the best game winning quarterbacks in the league, you should know better not to take it out and you should kneel it in the end zone and give your quarterback a chance. Aaron Rodgers is one of the best in the league in winning games in the final seconds. Yeah. Okay. So I guess kind of, uh, so what is keeping Los Angeles afloat? Well, I got to say is their offense. You look at guys like Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, who is, who is turned into one of the most versatile running backs in the league. I mean, Todd Gurley has turned into, what can I say about Todd Gurley? <laughs> hmm. I mean, Todd Gurley <laughs> is completely unreal at running back. He's a guy who, I mean, he has good ball carrier vision. He can also catch the ball. I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this Sunday's matchup against the Saints. It's pretty much mm. going to be Alvin Kamara versus Todd Gurley. Because you look at Alvin Kamara, he's a, I mean, he's a versatile running back. You got Todd Gurley versus the running back. So oh. I gotta say, it, it, it has to be their offense. Well, so uh, you know, yeah, I, I really still say that the uh, Rams should try to find someone to actually be behind Todd Gurley just in case he goes bent down. You know, I mean, because things happen. The, the the thing the the thing right now is to have two capable running backs and it looks like two tight ends is becoming a thing now too some type of trend <laughs> yeah I mean what do you think when you look at the uh, last few teams to win the Super Bowl um, or, or even get there they had at least two running backs and a formidable catching receiver I'm, I'm sorry tight end hmm so, you know, and, uh, and defense has just kind of been a thing that, well, yeah, defense wins championships. Um, they don't exist right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing a whole bunch of defenses in this league. I mean, one of the best defenses I've seen in this league so far, I mean, is Baltimore. But, I mean, Baltimore uh, has, you know, they fought, they fell flat on their faces against Carolina this past Sunday. Well, and, yeah, well, it's one of the more surprising things. Is that there aren't really that many good teams. So you still wouldn't go ahead and like already like put a team that you would bank on winning it all this season or bank on coming out of a conference yet. Well, I mean, a lot of the conferences are still up for grabs outside of the uh, NFC um, West. Uh, the West is really the only one that's mostly decided with the Rams having a, a I want to say a three or four game lead and then right behind them is Seattle and Seattle is just that they, they it's kind of like they did with Seattle they're trying to find consistency and they're trying to find they're trying to find balance in their team I mean they, they, Earl Thomas is, is pretty much done for the season Cam Chance is pretty much done for his career yeah you he's lose, not coming you, back he has already said he doesn't plan on coming back you, you lose Michael Bennett to the Eagles. You lose Richard Sherman to the Niners. I mean, you got the Griffin twins. I mean, and they're still young. They're, they're you know, they're, they're still pretty young and they, they still haven't really came into their prime yet. And so the, the defense is in a real rebuilding mode. You have Russell Wilson who's doing everything he can to carry that team on his back. And so this, I mean, Seattle, of course, they're not coming out the NFC West. The NFC South is far from decided. I mean, you, you look at the conference, you know, the, the division, there's a three-game separation between all four teams. Yeah. You talk about the uh, NFC South? NFC South. And not only that, I mean, Jameis Winston, he, he got benched against the Snacks. Dude four got picks. benched for, for uh, Fitz Magic. Fitz Magic is back, and Tampa Bay, oh. Uh, so why did they why did they bench uh, Fitzgerald to begin with? It was such a great uh, alternative to Winston. Well, here's how. I, well, of course, Jameis Winston was suspended for the first three games of the season due to his right. Uber driving incident, and Fitz Magic got put in. <laughs> did a pretty good job until they faced off against uh, Chicago. Fitzgerald wasn't looking so hot, and that was actually uh, Jameis Winston's first game eligible. 
So there could, of course, James Winston being the franchise quarterback, they choose to put Winston in. And he goes against Cincinnati and throws four picks. And, of course, you put Fitzpatrick in. Tampa was down 27-9 at halftime. And Fitzmagic put him in position to win until Cincinnati got the ball last. They got in field goal range, and they won the game 37-34. And so, of course, you want to put in a guy who puts you in position of success, and that's Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Well, you know, back to your – well, yeah, that's his – I mean, outside the NFC West, where the Rams are eight and zero, and then Seattle's four and three. That's uh, what a three and, and a half game lead. And, and the NFC North is is even tighter. I mean, you're looking at a one game difference between all four teams. Exactly. Okay, so there's a one game difference between uh, the leader and the and the bottom feeder. So it's, uh, at this point, uh, it's anybody. The, the division's complete toss up. In, in NFC East. The only team that I would rule out would be the New York Giants. Yeah, because uh, um, again, it, there's little separation between the number three team and the and the one at top in Washington. I. Yeah, we're only at halfway, but even even halfway through, you you do t- typically see some uh, s- some sort of uh, definitive leadership as far as who's gonna who's more likely going to win the uh, division at this point. Well, I mean NFC East, I gotta go with the Washington Redskins because they're well, Redskins I mean, look like won, they've won four of their last five games. Yeah, the the Redskins I mean, are looking like they're gonna take control of this division. Philadelphia, if they keep performing the way they're performing, they're not going to win a division because they've been having an up-down, up-down year. Right. Dallas Cowboys, they're still trying to find a consistent offense. And, you know, they have a defense that's not really able to make stops. Yeah, and then you know, AFC West, Kansas City, yeah, they're 7-1, and one, but uh, Los mm-hmm. Angeles Chargers are sitting right behind them at 5-2. and, two. and LA Chargers, is, they, I mean, I wouldn't say they surprised me because I saw LA Chargers, I mean, I knew they were going to amount to... to Quite a basic success, but that surprised me is the position they're at right now. They're five and two, and they're showing no signs of stopping. Houston has won their past five games in a row after it, starting off zero and three. Mm-hmm. The thing with Houston though is that they've won five straight, and I, you know, give them credit for that. But it hasn't been against a team, or at least I don't think they've beaten a team with like a considerably good record. Let's see, pull that up. I'm actually curious now. I mean, they beat Jacksonville, who's struggling. They beat the Dallas Cowboys, struggling. They beat Miami, who started off pretty hot, but they've struggled. Let's see, where's he? Here we go. So let's look at this. Five straight wins. It started with, let's see, they started 0-2. 0-3. They lost 0-3. They lost, okay, yeah, okay. So they lost to New York. They beat Indianapolis, struggling. They beat Dallas, struggling. They beat Buffalo, who's struggling. They beat Jacksonville, struggling. They beat Miami, who started off hot, but they're struggling now. They they lose Ryan Tannehill again. They got Brock Osweiler in. Yeah, Miami started 3-1, and and now they're now 4-4. So, I don't know, man. I'm waiting for someone other than like the three or four teams that you can sit there and say, okay, this team's going to make the playoffs to actually step up and start playing like they want to do something. It's just, you know, AFC, I mean, it's a complete toss up in the AFC. I mean, because you never yeah, know. So many, medi- you, so many teams are mediocre. I mean, you got teams like the LA Chargers, you got Kansas City Chiefs, the New England Patriots, Houston Texans. Pittsburgh Steelers, Cincinnati Bengals, you got so many teams who could potentially come out the AFC that I'm not going to even put um, I'm not putting all my chips in the Chiefs basket. I'm not going to say, oh, they are they are definitely going to come out the AFC because, I mean, we've learned over the years, can never ju- don't overlook the wild card. I mean, you look at Dallas, no. number one seed in the playoffs in Dak's rookie season, 13-3, and three, <laughs> divisional playoff game, all this momentum, Aaron Rodgers come to town, and Green Bay eliminates Dallas. So just because you're number one seed doesn't mean you're automatically going to come out your conference because right. I've seen number one seeds get knocked out in the divisional round. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, AFC, you never know what's going to happen. Same thing with NFC. I mean, yeah, you got the Rams who are eight and no, but I mean, they still got some teams ahead of them. They still got, they still got to go to the dome this Sunday to go against one of the hottest teams, the new Orleans saints. And so you, <laughs> You also got Fitzmagic back in right there for Tampa Bay, so he he can get the Buccaneers' momentum. 
You got the Falcons. You really can't count the Falcons out either because you get, I mean, Deion Jones is getting ready to come back, you know, within the next few weeks. You got Matt Ryan. You got Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones, Tack McKinley. I mean, Falcons got some players on their team as well. So you really can't count anybody out unless, you know, you're talking about the Niners or the Giants or the Raiders or the Bills. Okay, so next week, week uh, nine, I want to say, was it nine or ten? This is week nine. Week nine. Okay, Saints, Rams at Saints. That's an obvious no, no brainer. That That's is the game of the week. Game right of now. the week right there. Uh, next best game. Next best game. I would have to say. I would have to say Packers and Patriots. You got uh, Aaron Rodgers yeah, going against yeah. Tom Brady. Yeah, I have to agree with that one. Um. The next one, I will have to say Bucks and Panthers. Fitz Magic's back in, and you're going against a Panthers team who who looks to take some type of control of the NFC South. Or I don't know, uh, Chargers Seahawks. That kind of intrigues me a little bit. A little bit. I mean, I don't think Seahawks defense has what it takes to to shut down a powerful Chargers offense. I mean, I feel it's going to be a game from the start, but I feel the Chargers can probably pull it out. But then again, it's going to be at the 12th man in, in, in CenturyLink Field in Seattle. And uh, I'm looking right now at a game that I would sit here and say, why do we have to see this? And that is Raiders at 49ers. Uh, well, uh, be a nice little pillow fight. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, a game that intrigues me, and of course, I love watching, you know, the AFC North battles, Steelers and Ravens. Classic matchup, classic rivalry. That is classic AFC rivalry. AFC North showdown. Steelers, they want to redeem themselves from when Baltimore came into Heinz Field and, and knocked them off. So, Steelers, going, ha- they got a chance at retribution in this game. All right, college football. Let's My keep favorite. It, keep it rolling. Um... Key matchups this week, some interesting storylines that I did not expect are actually starting to uh, develop, and uh, we'll get to LSU Bama later. We know that's coming up, trust me. But a uh, bit of a surprise. Okay, so it is not unusual for LSU and Alabama to meet with the SEC West on the line, correct? Correct. It is a bit... In fact, it is absolutely unheard of to have Georgia and Kentucky meeting with the SEC East on the line. That's that's weird. (laughs) Usually we would say, oh, Georgia had to meet up with Florida for the SEC East or they would have to meet up with uh, Georgia and Florida. They've they've always been, you know, the better teams in the SEC East. Mm hmm. Kentucky, Kentucky, who only has one loss, they're they're eligible for for playoffs here, man. <laughs> they're they're still they eligible are. for playoffs because Kentucky, if one win against Georgia, Kentucky can find themselves in the top ten. I mean, they're right there on the fringe of it at number eleven. I want to say. Think about it. Think about it. Look, I'm, I'm not trying to think too far in the future, but I'm thinking very far in the future. You look at this top four now, it, it's, it's going to change, of course. Oh, yeah. It, but by the end of this weekend, it's going to change. But if you look at Kentucky, if Kentucky wins out, and if by any chance in the world they end up winning the SEC championship, you could be looking at Kentucky in the college football playoff. Wait, that is just... That's, that's that, weird. That is so weird. And especially, the, and, and, especially and, and, when you consider their quarterback play. And now, 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 look, their quarterback play was pretty impressed. Was wasn't too bad against Missouri. I mean, he threw the ball more, and he was actually, um, you know, more precise with the ball. Well, you know, it is. I looked at I looked at his stats, and it's just like, okay, how do you complete sixty three percent of your passes? Uh, for it with like five interceptions, and only. F- Four touchdowns. Well, now you, you, five you, touchdowns. You do, you do know year. if Kentucky ends up in like a college football playoff, you do know that will be 
we're pretty much gonna be in the twilight zone <laughs> and that's that's when it's time to ask whoever is come ask the aliens to wake us up and send us back to earth okay yeah another interesting um thing is uh if the playoffs begin today or the season ended today here's your pac-12 championship washington state versus utah I didn't think that this season. I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, Washington and Oregon. I was thinking along along those lines because I mean Oregon they have a much improved team, but they completely just they completely wet the bed against Arizona. I mean they went up against a very a struggling Wildcats team under Kevin Summon and got completely decimated. By the way, Kentucky is in top 10 already. They're number nine in the country. So they got voted up to number nine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Washington State and Utah. Okay. We've always, I've, or at least I've always known that Utah was one of those schools that you could never count out. They always, however, since making the jump to the Pac-12, they kind of seem to have that up and down. What was like, as soon as they're doing good, they start doing bad type of deal. But I mean Washington State. I mean, ever, I mean, I mean, ever I, since this, in the you know the uh, <clears throat> the barrage of you know of you know Luke Falk that quarterback last season. I mean, Washington State they they turned into one of the better offensive teams. I mean, having Coach Mike Leach you know at the helm, mm-hmm. I mean, Washington State is not a team that you could you could, like you could count out. No, and a, 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 their win against Stanford was a huge statement. Okay, and finally, the other interesting storyline is, okay, we could pretty much figure at this point that Ohio State is going to meet Michigan with the winner going on to the Big Ten championship game. To play, as of right now, Northeastern. Northwestern. It's actually Northwestern. It's Northwestern? Yeah. Northwestern had a big win against Wisconsin, and Wisconsin, they just completely fallen off. They had their loss against BYU. They go to the big house, get blown out by Michigan, and then they get upset by Northwestern. I mean, well, I mean, and the, here's the reason why. Wisconsin doesn't have an offense. Their, own, their only offense is their running back. I know, but the, and, I mean, Northwestern? Of all teams, Northwestern. And I don't know why people like, they like to give Wisconsin so much credit Alex Hornerbrook, I mean, he's a Bismarck quarterback. I mean, you would think at least either Wisconsin or Michigan State or Iowa, but Northwestern. Out of all people. <laughs> so, I mean, even though it is kind of, in, to some degree, a, a more typical college football season, there's definitely been some prizes. Surprises. And oh, Washington State is ranked eighth in the country. Just gonna let you know that. So you have some teams in the top ten who are so creeping is, up. Is is that from the uh, the collegiate football playoff rankings? Yes, collegiate football playoff rankings. Washington State is ranked eighth. And so I just want to let you know, for teams in the top four, Alabama, LSU, Clemson, Notre Dame. So I want to let you know there are some teams that are looking to take your spot. Teams like Georgia, Kentucky, Michigan. Oklahoma, okay. yeah. even though Oklahoma is 7-1, even though they had, they had lost against Texas, Oklahoma is still creeping in there. Washington State is still creeping. So top 10, I mean, got to watch out. Oh, and Northwestern plays Notre Dame this week. So Northwestern has a chance to be a uh, a playoff buster. <laughs> a playoff buster. Or just be a really crappy opponent for whoever. Whoever wins Ohio State Michigan uh, game. I, I don't know about a crappy opponent. <laughs> <laughs> they almost beat Michigan. They had a well, they're, 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 Michigan. What, they're they're like five and three and unranked and you know, Michigan and Ohio State are probably gonna go into that game in the top five or well, top six really. I mean Michigan's ranked fifth and they got Michigan has a, a big game come up. They got Penn State. I mean Penn State I feel is a team that that can still control their destiny, but I mean it's gonna take it's going to take some teams losing. It's going to take Penn State to win out. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, what I've learned is that Penn State now, they have to rely on 
the grit of Trace McSorley, who has pretty much carried his team on his back. Right. Texas took a huge hit after losing to Oklahoma State this past Saturday, but they got a chance to redeem themselves and get themselves back in the hunt as they go against West Virginia. Yeah, I mean, um, in the Big 12, Big 12 can end up getting left out of the playoff picture altogether. Uh, the only hope they it looks like they really have is um, would, or would be Oklahoma, and Oklahoma's trailing Texas. And Texas losing Dude, to Oklahoma, and Texas losing to Oklahoma State doesn't look good on Oklahoma's resume. No, um, you know it's just like Texas currently holds the tiebreaker with Oklahoma, and uh, Texas is not going to get into the playoffs and, at a, as a two-loss team right and, now. And also the college football playoff, not even like really looking at like you know, of course you know, the wins and losses, not only looking at records and. You know, this player has, they need to have what it takes to be in a playoff. But still, I mean, you also got to look at resumes. Your resume will either make you or break you. You look at right. last year, Correct. Ohio State, they took a huge hit on off their resume when they got blown out by Iowa. This year, if I if Ohio State gets snubbed out of a playoff, it's going to be because of their blowout loss at Purdue. You also got, you I mean, the eye test. I mean, of course, I would put Ohio State in there do, do, despite losing to Purdue. You look at Ohio State. They have a pretty good defense. They got a Heisman candidate quarterback in Dwayne Haskins. I mean, they, they just have an all-around pretty good team. Honestly, of course, I mean, of course, we're going to get more into LSU and Alabama, but, I mean, Greg McElroy said it best. We're doing the eye test after seeing how, how LSU's played. I mean, I wouldn't put LSU in the top four, but if you look at their resume, LSU is more deserving than anybody in this country being in the college football playoff because they have the strongest resume in the nation. They knocked right. off out of five ranked opponents they played they knocked out four of them that's miami auburn mississippi state and georgia three of those teams at the time that they played them were top 10 opponents at the time yeah georgia still is so oh so what else we got going on i mean what, should we talk a little bit about lsu alabama yeah different show uh, uh, yeah Cajun Connection as we're dedicated to Louisiana sports. Um, but yeah, it is um, it, it, the way it's looking right now is that LSU Alabama is going to be number one versus number three. So And pretty much the winner of that game will be the number one team in the nation come next week. Plus the winner will also more than likely end up repping the uh, SEC the, West. SEC West. That's so. considering if LSU can overcome one more hurdle and that would be Texas A&M. I mean Let's be real. I, LSU have to go to College Station. They have to go to College Station. Jimbo and Fisher. And, you know, Texas A&M, that's known as a 12th man in College Station. They have to go against Jimbo Fisher and the Aggies, led by Kellen Mond, who, in my opinion, is a quarterback that's trying to come to his own. Hasn't completely found his stride yet, but he is improving. So, I feel that would be one more hurdle for LSU have to overcome. Oh well, look, there's 293 tickets left. As low as 275. Oh wow! So college game day is coming to Baton Rouge this Saturday. Want we'll to catch up with the college game day crew so we can finesse a couple tickets? Come on now, you know you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm down for that. Hey, so when we're gonna be at, on LSU campus super early Saturday morning, and we're going to find a college game day crew. We'll find some officials with ESPN and see if we can finesse some tickets. <laughs> I'm serious about it. John laughing. I'm serious about it. Uh, oh, my I, I know you are. I just don't have high hopes. Look, I go in with low expectations. That way I can't be disappointed as oh, no, much. I go into everything with high expectations. I go in, I can go into a classroom high expectations. I can go into a training event. I can go into a bedroom with high expectations. Not going to go into any more of my personal life. Hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> Here, here's um Mississippi State versus Louisiana Tech. Do the Bulldogs win or lose? <laughs> right, that's I, it, I re- folks. I realize that one. <laughs> yeah. It's more like when Peter went to Ireland to see his dad, and they get you know it's Peter and Mickey McFinnigan. They get into a game of drink, and so I mean. O'Brien, the sheep, says, I, I I got 50 on the fat one. And both Brian say, which one's the fat one? I got 50 on the Bulldogs. Which Bulldogs? <laughs> yeah. 
You realize the LSU is 3-0 against Bulldogs this year? I just realized that. Mississippi <laughs> State, Louisiana Tech, and Georgia. Nice. <laughs> you a dog, don't step to a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for listening to Let's Talk Football. I'm John Barron. I'm Joshua Perkins. Signing out. Let's Talk Football!